Today we're going to do Rover 2.0 lymphoma and hematologic malignancies. Um, we have a wonderful discussion coming up on three great cases. Um, next slide. Um, and I'm going to let the panelists um, introduce themselves, but a few ground rules. Um, if you send in a chat to make sure that you um, send it to all panelists and all attendees so that everyone can see the question. Um, and with that, we'll get started. So, Dr. Yang. Hi, I'm really excited to be here with you guys today. My name is Joanna Yang. I am um, currently at WashU in St. Louis, just moved over from UCSF, um, and I'm the lymphoma service chief here. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with Drs. Panix and Rabinovich, and really looking forward to a good discussion. Hi, everybody. My name is Chelsea Panix. Uh, I'm at MD Anderson on the Hematologic Malignancy Service. We are now um, a pretty good big group there that just focus on heme, a party of five, which is a lot of fun. Um, and I'm really excited about being here today. I'm Rachel Rabinovich at the University of Colorado. This is my first Rover um, session, so I'm excited to participate and I manage um, breast cancer and lymphoma, those are two, my two areas. So um, nice to meet you all. All right, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So this was a very interesting case I saw recently. Advance the slide. So she is a young woman, 38 year old woman, had double hit diffuse large B cell lymphoma was diagnosed in May of 2020. And um, because it was double hit, she went on to receive dose-adjusted REPOC at six cycles. And then because she had initial involvement of her bilateral kidneys, which I'll show you later, um, she did get CNS prophylaxis with intrafecal methotrexate for six um, doses. And basically she did great. Her interim and end of treatment PETs um, both showed CRs. And I don't know, um, Chelsea and Rachel, if at your institution, you're still using, um, you find your medocs are still using dose-adjusted REPOC and double hit and triple hit um, large cell lymphomas. Um, very definitely. Yeah, we are. If you, if they had, you know, the randomized trial that compared our top to dose-adjusted our EPOC for all comers. And one of the criticisms was that maybe that the, the really high risk pa patients were underrepresented in that study. And so on, on planned subset analysis, there's been team, tended to be a trend for benefit in this patient population. So we, we they are medical oncologists will routinely give just the start epoch for our um, double hit and triple hit patients. Yeah, same here. Um, so just for the residents who are on the call, um, you know, the in phase two trials and even on this uh, large phase three randomized control trial, we did see that double hit and triple hit patients had worse outcomes and that they did benefit from some kind of escalation of therapy. In this case, it was escalation to dose adjusted REPOC. So, anyway, she did great. Uh, she's a young woman, otherwise really healthy, completed all of her therapy. And then, about three months after completing her therapy, she developed some right um, eye pain. And so, she went to go see her primary care doctor, who noticed that her eye was a little bit red. Um, and referred her to um, an optometrist who treated her for what he thought was anterior uveitis. Um, and she was being followed by him. And so basically they're treating this anterior uveitis with topical steroids and she would get the topical steroids and feel a little bit better. Um, and then she decided to um, see another optometrist who actually started noticing that she had these iris nodules that were the color of her um, eyes, which is brown, um, and he actually referred her to um, an ophthalmologist who thought maybe this was actually tumor. So her medical oncologist got a new PET scan, um, and this showed intense uptake in the anterior right globe, no other sites of disease, and eventually she went for a biopsy of the right iris, and it showed relapse, double hit, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, exactly similar to her original disease, um, only involving the iris. Go to the next slide. 
So this is a picture and um, that our, um, um, our ophthalmologist, Dr. Piggott, took. And I think this is a really great photo. Um, it's very, I actually told her it was really artistic too, but you can see that there are these um, nodules within the iris and all of these nodules are actually lymphoma. And then also, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but maybe um, Nav, you can just point out this fluid layer at the bottom of the iris. When I saw that, I thought that initially it must be um, pus, maybe she had an, a super infection of the iris. But they sam the ophthalmologist actually sampled that and found that it was layered um, lymphoma cells. So, so they had literally fallen out of her iris and, and had layered at the bottom. I don't know, um, Rachel. This or is Chelsea, such an impressive it. photograph. No. Wow. Yeah, it was. I had never seen anything like it. It was super um, interesting. So, okay, next slide. I have her PET scan up on the left. So the left is her original PET scan. And then on the, um, you can see that she had disease in the mediastinum involving the sternum and then bilateral kidney involvement. Um, and some nodes that were a little bit higher up in the neck. Um, and then we may have to replay the, um, the new PET scan. So this is her PET scan at the time of relapse. And you can see we're coming down on her brain and you can see in the right I anteriorly, there's a lot of FDG avidity, and really there was no disease anywhere else. Okay, next slide. It's interesting too, because I saw that they gave her um, intrathecal chemotherapy because it looks like her CNS IPI score was high with the bilateral renal involvement. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So for the residents, there are some sites um, that really tend, there are some sites that we think are really associated with an increased risk of CNS relapse. And those are exactly as Dr. Pinnock said, in the kidney and or adrenal gland, um, in the uterus, um, testicular is probably the most well known, um, and actually in the breast as well. So those patients, even if they don't have CNS involvement up front, so this patient had several LPs, they were all negative um, for involvement by her lymphoma, she had a high risk of um, CNS relapse um, based on the fact that she had bilateral kidney involvement, so she did get CNS prophylaxis. So um, this is the patient, and so the poll question is, what should we do next? Should we start salvage chemotherapy? Should we um, give her some intraorbital chemotherapy? Should we give her salvage radiation therapy? Um, should she have local resection of the disease? Okay, so it looks like the group is pretty equally split on initiating salvage systemic therapy versus initiating salvage radiation therapy. Um, no one wanted to refer her for local resection. That's exactly right. It probably would involve um, an iridectomy or, or likely in her case, a nucleation of the eye. Um, and then uh, about 8% suggested maybe we should do um, intraorbital chemotherapy. So we'll um, go ahead and talk about the next step. So this is really, really challenging. And I am no ophthalmologist, but I did learn a lot from our ophthalmologist for this case. Um, so basically she had an anterior segment tumor. Anterior segment tumors generally are coming from the iris um, or ciliary body, and rarely are they coming from the cornea or the lens. And if you remember nothing else from this case, it's really that delivery to this area is extremely, extremely, extremely challenging. So you can see, the eye has several mechanisms for defense that are innately built in. So um, all of these help protect the eye, but then specifically there are also barriers to actually help protect the anterior part of the eye. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so when we're thinking about chemotherapy, there is actually a blood, there are two barriers that are really important. So there's the blood aqueous barrier, which is really help protecting the anterior portion of the eye, which is where the iris is. And that actually makes intraarterial chemotherapy really challenging. So when you think about um, diseases like retinoblastoma, for example, where intraarterial chemotherapy is actually much more commonly used, that's usually actually penetrating best in the posterior um, segment of the eye. 
And then when you think about systemic chemotherapy, um, the blood retinal barrier can actually prevent good penetrance of systemic therapy. It's not zero, so there is some penetrance, but these innate barriers actually um, make intraarterial chemotherapy and systemic therapy challenging. So go to the next slide. So I can you go can you go I back to your previous slide for one second? Just to point out, yeah. I love what you put here. So like just to point out for diffuse large B cell lymphoma that involves the um, the vitriol, the, the eye, it's typically vitriol retinal involvement. And this whole space that you guys are seeing where the vitriol fluid is, you know, that's where cells will typically reside when you have ocular involvement for CNS lymphoma or diffuse large B cell with, um, you know, secondary involvement of the eye. That's the more typical presentation. So it's just really highlighting the the uniqueness of your case, Joanna. Really nice. To yeah, that's out. exactly right. So, yeah, that's exactly right, Charles. And most commonly, you're seeing involvement in the posterior aspect of the eye. Um, okay, next slide. So, I think in an ideal plan, um, you guys are when you um, answer the poll, you got you are really on the right track. I think in an ideal plan for an average case, we do like to see that the patient has some kind of chemosensitivity to salvage chemotherapy. In this case, it's challenging, right? Because we know that there's probably inadequate penetration of the anterior segment of the eye using systemic therapy. Um, and then the other question is, is this truly an isolated relapse? Does she, is she at risk elsewhere in her body, particularly since she had stage four disease up front? So when we discussed her in tumor board, board treatment, um, her medical oncologist really wanted to try to give her some salvage chemotherapy um, for this exact reason, to see if there is chemosensitivity within the disease. Um, and I agreed with that. I think that's actually very reasonable. Um, in her case, either way, you know, she was going to get consolidative radiation. And because she's young and she relapsed just three months after completing therapy, she was actually going to go on to an autologous stem cell transplant. And we had a backup plan, which was that if she was refractory to salvage chemo, um, we would give her salvage radiation and take her to transplant sooner. Dr. Yang, I'll interject. So I think what's... Um extra unique about your case is not only did this patient receive systemic chemotherapy, CNS prophylaxis, but she relapsed in essentially, essentially a sanctuary site. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of where it gets a little bit more complicated for all of us, which I think was reflected in what the um, residents all pulled, because if it right. if this patient had relapsed anywhere in the abdomen and the chest, it would have been pretty straightforward. But the question yes. is, in a sanctuary site that is sort of resistant to systemic therapy from the get-go, is systemic therapy really what you need, or do you need very, do you need high-dose chemotherapy, or is just some local therapy what you need to get that patient to a CR, a durable CR? That's right. That's exactly right. And so what I have here, which I think is uh, was a really important study, is actually um, a figure from the Scholar One study. And this study basically wanted to see the outcome, you know, basically wanted to look at the outcomes in refractory diffuse large cell lymphoma. So they included patients who were primary refractory, meaning they got their first line chemotherapy and they never really had a good response, but also patients who relapsed less than 12 months from, um, uh, less than 12 months from um, basically completing all of their initial therapy. And I think the take home from this slide is really that everyone does overall pretty Poorly. So, you know, two-year survival for these patients was basically about 20%. And if you look, um, really the, the one place where there is some separation is basically in figure part C and part D, which is if you do have some, in part C, if you do have some sensitivity to your salvage chemotherapy, you're going to do better than if you don't have sensitivity to your salvage chemotherapy. And then in part D, it's really saying, you know, if you go on to an autologous stem cell transplant, which largely you can only do if you have um, disease that's sensitive to salvage chemotherapy, you're going to do better than if you can't go on to an autologous stem cell transplant. Is there anything, um, Chelsea or Rachel, that you would want to add to um, this, um, this figure? No, that sounds good. Yeah. So I think this is a really important study for us as radiation oncologists because I do think that it really highlights a potential role that we have. And one is there are situations where folks have isolated areas of disease. These are the non responders They're not responding to salvage chemotherapy, but radiation can be used to render them PET negative 
and take them to transplant, um, which we know is gonna allow them to have better outcomes. All right, next slide. So she was simulated for radiation um, and at the same time started on cycle one of salvage chemotherapy. Um, she got RD Hox, which is very um, standard. You know, there are several options that that um, that people can can do. And again, it's kind of like um, Dr. Rabinovitz was saying. You know, the goal is really to get her to be to have a PET CR so that she can go into transplant. We know um, that basically patients who go into their autologous stem cell transplants in a PET CR do better than patients who go in with PET rabbit disease. And I don't know, Chelsea and Rachel, how often in your practice you're kind of salvaging these, these isolated areas um, to kind of help patients become PET negative before auto transplant. I don't know if that's a, a, a big part of your practice. Yeah, that's a, a, an area I think that's often debated um, because if they're, not, if they're chemo refractory, um, but responding to radiation, the whole purpose of auto is to utilize you know, high dose chemotherapy. And so we always debate whether um, it still makes sense to take someone to auto if they were chemo refractory, but respond to radiation. So that's an area of debate. And then the other piece is um, how much pet positive disease is there. So our transplant folks use a more aggressive autologous high dose chemotherapy regimen um, that has some cytobine and a host of other drugs. And so often they don't like us to radiate beforehand, especially if it's in the chest and we, they prefer us strongly for us to consolidate after. So sometimes you don't have a choice if there's disease there and you're trying to move forward with auto. I think the discussion is becoming, uh, is definitely changing. We're pivoting to new direction with all of the CAR T cell therapy um, yeah. that's merged. We're in the middle of treating, I'm in our department, a similar but different case of a young man um, who presented with stage four disease, which included testicular involvement. And he was treated with dose adjusted. Our EPOC had a CR everywhere, a good response in the testis, um, but still some pet avidity. And we had the same conversation about whether salvage chemotherapy, auto, just radiation, because he responded beautifully everywhere but in the testis. So the same type of conversation and the same type of sanctuary site um, and conversation there. Yeah, we um, actually, we had this, uh, when I was at MSK, we put together an experience with our transplant folks of basically radiating folks exactly like you described, um, Rachel, who had, these, who had really good responses almost everywhere except for a few sites, and they weren't always sanctuary sites. And these folks generally got radiation. And I think the most surprising finding was that there were long-term survivors. I mean, people with chemorefractory disease who, who got salvage radiation to these isolated sites and then became long-term survivors. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's been hard to publish it primarily because, you know, it's, it's so, it's such a unique question in a highly specialized, you know, highly selected cohort of patients. Um, but you're right, I think it's, a, it's an area of active debate. Okay, next slide. So this is her radiation treatment plan. Um, and I actually chose to use Ruby conformal. I actually did do field and field as well. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to maximally spare her left orbit. So basically I wanted zero dose to her left orbit. And um, I'll be interested to hear from uh, Dr. Penix and Dr. Rabinovitz, if they would use IMRT versus 3D. Um, primarily, you know, so she, she already has cataracts in her right eye. She had it even before starting radiation. And that's probably from kind of the steroid use that she was doing for about a month or so. Um, so I ended, I treated the whole orbit um, kind of as per ISRT guidelines, um, treating the whole um, organ, quote unquote. Um, and then I, I chose to use this 3D, 3D plan with field and field. The field and field is primarily to increase the homogeneity of the plan. Um, and then I did add a bolus just to ensure there was good coverage anteriorly. Um, it was a three millimeter bolus. Um, what dose did you treat Dr. Yang? I treated to 36 gray, 18 fractions. What would, um, what would you guys have done? Would you have treated um, to a higher dose? So this was after her first, this was after the salvage chemo. So it, was it response assessed, assessed yeah, after so, that? Yeah, oh, so 
Thanks, Chelsea. I totally forgot to mention that. So she started her first cycle of chemotherapy and she did actually have response in the eye, but before she initiated her next cycle, she already had um, increased pain. Um, and it really, and she was being seen by the um, ophthalmologist every week and it seemed like she was having some progression of her disease. So she had an initial response and progression. And so we actually decided not to proceed with more salvage chemotherapy and to actually give her salvage radiation and bring her straight to transplant. I don't know if you guys would have done something differently in that situation. That's tough with a chemo non-responsive pet avid disease. I normally think of doses higher than 36, but it's also a very sensitive site and she is right. going to an aloe. So I think what you did is very reasonable. I might have treated her to 40, but you know, normally in any other site outside the orbit, I would have gone to 40 to 50. Um, but not, not in the anterior chamber of the eye. Yeah, and what about you, Chelsea? Yeah, I think that, that kind of would echo what Dr. Zinnick said. Um, outside of, you know, you're dealing with more sensitive normal tissues and structures surrounding for a refractory double hit case that, you know, having very quick kinetic failure after the first cycle, the outcome is gonna be pretty poor overall, unfortunately. Um, but you do want to think about dose escalation to at least 40, between 40 and 50 gray, typically. Um, and so I think that I would have done something similar to what you, you did. I probably would have maybe thought about doing 40 because you're at a point where you're already approaching the retina tolerance. And so it's like right. not like you're going to be able to retreat to another definitive dose. So I might have thought about just trying to maximize that first yeah. go at it. It's hard to see on this um, this um, scan, but anteriorly, that, that is where they they basically made that area more hot and, fo and focused the yeah. hot spot. So it does hit 40 anteriorly, but the rest of the yeah, I, the rest is yeah. But the, but the bolus is really important in this case. I mean, even if yeah. you're doing VMAT and you have those oblique angles coming in, that's going to increase your surface dose you would still want absolute assurity that you're getting full dose at the surface. So I think definitely one key to this is the conclusion of bolus. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I actually might have, I, I didn't, I don't remember exactly what you did in the plan, but might have just waited anteriorly. So you're getting the 36 to 40 anteriorly and only 30 gray posteriorly since there was never evidence yeah. of cells or pet positivity in the posterior. Yeah. That's exactly what we did with field and field. So we, so it was hotter anteriorly, and then um, was didn't um, exceed 36 gray posteriorly. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I thought this was a great case primarily, and she's completed all of her therapy, um, and she is um, heading, and she had actually great resolution. Um, we didn't repeat a PET scan, but we did. She was being seen by the ophthalmologist weekly. And I think a couple of interesting um, points. So one, the nodules started slowly disappearing from the iris and that I could actually see clinically starting um, about a week and a half into treatment. But she also had this retinal detachment basically from exudate and, and that was slowly kind of um, improving also during, during the course of therapy. And she did have, she actually tolerated therapy really well. She had just really great I would say like between grade one to dermatitis uh, over the skin, primarily because of the bolus. I um, mean, she's uh, admitted now and she's gonna have her um, transplant. So I think this was a great case primarily because it was really, it was, um, it was challenging because one, thinking about the sequencing of therapy and whether to even try salvage chemotherapy, um, specifically thinking about access to the anterior orbit um, and then I think overall, just thinking about treatment options for these patients. Um, so thinking about whether to give her additional um, CNS prophylaxis. Um, also just thinking about whether or not in someone who's young and otherwise really healthy, if it's reasonable to do something like CAR T cell therapy for early relapses, which I don't know if you guys are talking mm -hmm. about that at your institutions, but we're talking about that all the time. Right now it's for the residents only approved for um, after you failed two lines of um, therapy. The therapy, yeah. Did they ever talk about, so I think for this case, the one thing we might've talked about would be doing um, high dose methotrexate um, based regimen, something that has more CNS penetration because with you know yeah. anterior ocular relapse, you worry about the rest of her CNS as well. But 
I mean, I don't think there's any right reason in these type of unique situations. Um, and then anything, I don't know, Rachel. There were two questions. Um, if there's any role for protons here, um, and then if there's any constraint to the lacrimal gland in this case. Yeah, good questions. I did not constrain the lacrimal gland um, in this case. And I do think actually, um, you know, I think theoretically protons may be a good, um, you know, are, are a good option when you're treating unilaterally. Um, but in this case, you know, I don't know what it's like at, um, at your institutions. I know you have protons at MD Anderson, I'm not sure at University of Colorado, but um, our proton center is pretty busy. There's a pretty large pediatrics population. So actually it takes longer to start patients for protons than it does for photons. So with photons, you know, I was able to similarly get her started a couple of days, um, it, like a week later, you know, basically her plan was ready, but she could have started even the next day or the day after. And with protons, usually there's a, there's a couple of weeks delay. But I don't know if that's how that is at um, University of Colorado. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have protons. I think protons certainly would have been reasonable, but I think the greatest toxicity was in your target. So I don't know that you're getting a huge benefit from protons, but certainly reasonable. That's right. Yeah, I think also, I, would, I, I don't know if I would have felt great about using protons. I don't want, necessarily think I would want to spare the posterior chamber in this case. I mean, given how extensive her disease was, you really do worry about things that might be in the vitreous. So I don't know if you would really see a dramatic benefit dosimetrically um, compared to the photon, or even, I guess, technically you could have done electrons if you were thinking about sparing things more posteriorly. Um, but yeah, it's not a bad thought though. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder what you guys would have um, prioritized for kind of you know, your organs at risk. So for me, my main priority was actually making sure the left orbit was spared. I really didn't think I was gonna spare anything in the right orbit, but I wanted to make sure I spared the left orbit because that's the only eye that she can see out of. And then my yeah, second agree. priority was the brain, minimizing yeah. those injuries. All right, I think I'm up, yeah. Hopefully my ear, but I have enough battery to get us through this. All right, next slide. Okay, so this is the first case of a 72-year-old woman um, who presented with some complaints of difficulty breathing at night. She had uh, CT imaging that showed a uh, nasal cavity mass on the right side, and she had a biopsy. You can see it there. That's a CT image. It's very easy accessible. This um, diffuse large vesal lymphoma was a biopsy. We'll get a little bit more into the path. She had no other symptoms um, at all, so no night sweats, unexplained fevers. Um, I mean, unclean fevers or unintentional weight loss. Her bone marrow biopsy was negative. She had a normal LDH and she had an excellent performance status of zero. Next slide. So if you can play the video, um, this is her baseline PET scan. And it was described as a 2.5 centimeter mass in the right nasal turbinate with SCB of 14.6 uh, with no other site of disease noted on her PET scan. Next slide. Oh yeah, you can show it again if you want. <laughs> so for this 72 year old woman with the things I just mentioned, what is her stage and what is her IPI score? That's her poll question. Okay. All right, most of you, it's probably hard to remember all the information I, I had put in the previous slide, but, um, but most of you thought this was a stage 1E diffuse large fecal lymphoma with an IPI of 1. That's correct. So let's go to the next slide and we'll review why that's the case. So staging for lymphoma, in contrast to all the other gabillion staging systems that you guys have to memorize, sorry that you have to do that. Um, at least lymphoma, there's some complica complicated things about lymphoma, but staging is not one of them. So pretty straightforward. Stage one or stage two is limited stage on one side of the diaphragm, stage three on both sides of the diaphragm, and stage four, you can have bone marrow involvement or multiple sites of extranodal disease. Um, 
for diffuse large B cell in, in particular, we don't put A or B. The B symptoms are no longer reported, and that's really because they haven't found to uh, be prognostic. And they prefer now, instead of you putting X for bulky, to really just give details on the size or the dimensions of the largest nodal conglomerate. So she did have an extra nodal site of disease, just one of them in the nose, but it's just stage one. Next slide. Oh, can I just make one point on that slide? Um, Please do. Can we go back? For, for residents, one of the things I notice is often tested is they'll give you a case um, where they'll say this patient has a cervical node and a supraclavicular node, and they want you to stage the patient. At least I've seen it in on in-service exams. And I think the mm -hmm. important thing to remember is that they that's considered one nodal field, which um, is in that picture on the right-hand side of your screen. Yeah, and this actual diagram has a lot more relevance when you start comparing contrasting risk factors in nodal regions for pitting Hodgkin's lymphoma patients in risk groups, but that's not what we're talking about today. So. That's a great point. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Um, next slide. So for the um, IPI4, um, this is um, a way that we can kind of stratify patients based on risk. Um, and the mnemonic that most of you guys have probably heard is APPLE. So age greater than 60, a performance status of two or higher, elevated LDH, more than one extranodal site, or advanced stage disease. And so our, late, our patient was 72, but her LDH was normal. She had a great performance status. She had one extranodal site of disease, and she did not have um, advanced stage disease, so her IPI score was one. And in the original IPI grouping, there were, um, in the standard IPI, there was um, the number of risk factors separated patients into four groups, and that corresponded to um, PFS and overall survival outcomes. When rituximab um, really changed the, the therapeutic landscape for um, lymphoma overall several decades ago, they reexamined whether the IPI score was still valuable, was it still prognostic. And they found that these risk factors were still important, but instead of pulling people into patients into four groups, um, we had this cluster of three groups instead. And so now, in the more modern era, people also use the NCCN IPI score. I would tell you, I understand we don't really do that as much, but some people do. There's the CNS IPI score that we kind of alluded to in Dr. Yang's case that includes these factors as well as involvement of specific external sites like renal, um, kidney, and adrenal gland. Um, but the important thing to note is that when rituximab, which is now standard part of the treatment, is included, these, the IPI score is still important. Um, next slide. So let's get to the PAP. So um, it's no longer acceptable anymore just to say it's diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Like we want to know a lot more. And I'll tell you, this was um, some detail. These are some details from her PAP report. So she had um, positive on her specimen, was positive immunostaining for CD20, that's a B cell marker, CD45, TAX5, MUM1, BCL2, and BCL6. She had negative immunostaining for CD10 and CMIC. Um, despite the negative CMIC immunostaining, um, they did do FISH um, for in situ hybridization to assess for MIC gene rearrangement, and that was negative. Okay. Um, next slide. So, with that information I just gave you, um, how would you best classify this uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma? This is kind of tough when you can't see all the information. It's almost like testing your knowledge and your memory. Now that I'm seeing we're doing it in this format, so. Don't be too mad at me for the question. <laughs> See how you guys do. All right, let's check out the answer. Okay, kind of split all over the place. So <laughs> without one real dominant. Um, so let's talk about this. So it's actually a non-germinal center uh, B-cell immune phenotype. The answer was C. Go to the next slide. So we have the path up again here to show you that she it was an immunostaining with CD10 negative. And so um, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma now, we can kind of categorize patients into two general groups based on where the um, diffuse large B-cell was thought to originate at the point of lymphoid um, maturation. And so these two groups are the GCB and the, and the non-GCB, also some, known as activated B-cell type. 
Um, this was based on a, a landmark paper where they did um, gene expression profiling of the large group of free starch free cell lymphoma um, specimen, and they were able to um, cluster certain genes that separated patients into this GCB and non-GCB or a ABC group. Well, you can't do it's expensive and time-consuming. So you can't and you don't often have tissue to do microarrays on every single biopsy. So then as a surrogate of that, we use something called the Hahn algorithm. Um, and this paper was published in 2004 by Christina Hahn. And this is using different um, immunostaining profiling to basically um, mimic or as a surrogate for that um, gene expression profiling. And every path report now, you should see this on the path report, whether it's GCB or non-GCB. And most pathologists will be assessing by immunostaining CD10, BCL6, and MUM1. And so her uh, tumor, uh, the lymphoma, was CD10 negative. And, um, and so we know if you look at this, it's CD10 negative, it was BCL6 positive and MUM1 positive. So that's a non-GCB. Um, Another thing, if we go to the next slide, um, after we assess that group, whether it's GCB or non-GCB, the other things to look at, including genetic aberration um, in MYC BCL2 and BCL6. These patients are considered to have double hit or triple hit lymphoma, and these poor, um, perform very poorly. And this was the case that Dr. Yang had just showed us with a patient with double hit. Um, this is a very small population of diffuse large B cell lymphomas, less than 10%. Most people quote 4 to 8% of all comers. And the, the outcomes are so bad, and, the, um, and the, how they do is quite different from most diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients that the WHO introduced a new entity. So now we call it high-grade B cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 and or BCL6 gene rearrangement. And that is what we referred to previously as double hit or triple hit. Oh, hold on. I just lost my, can you guys still hear me? My iPods are dying. One second. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So with that in mind, um, her MYC was negative, so she did not have double hit. Within the intermediate category are double expressors or double protein expression. So these are patients that by immunostaining have a higher expression of MYC and BCL2 and or BCL6. Um, but without the actual gene rearrangement detected by FISH. And double expressors um, have outcomes that are kind of intermediate between the double hit, which you can see the gray curve is very poor, um, all others, and then the double expressors are in the middle. And we'll tell you, it can be a bit confusing because most double hit lymphomas or GCB happen in the germinal center, and germinal center has better outcomes than um, the non-germinal center. Um, but most double hits are truly germinal center. And the reason why germinal centers can still have good outcomes overall is because the double hits only represent such a small um, group of those patients. Um, it's kind of, it's a lot, but it's something that you really should be routinely looking out for on every path report. Does Dr. Yang or Dr. Rabinijit have anything to say about this? Nope, I think you gave an excellent summary, and I think these are areas that all radiation oncologists have to be familiar with. Yeah, and I think um, Yolanda Zhang um, at University of Washington has been really interested in seeing whether double hit or triple hit lymphomas are more resistant to radiation, which I think is really interesting. I know she's trying to pull data from a lot of institutions um, just to look at local control of those patients. Um, yeah, and, one of but. No, and in um, now with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, there are many subsets of presentations where in large trials, radiation hasn't shown to be a benefit, but that's just been all comers. And there's a lot of discussion that patients who have double hit lymphomas, who are a small subset of all of those, may be the patients that really do need the radiation and need you know, a look separately from these large trials that took all comers. Yeah, one of our residents recently looked at this with our group um, on, on patients that actually fully responded to upfront therapy. So limited stage patients that fully responded to our, our immunochemotherapy. And we looked at um, the outcomes and the local control was excellent across the board, regardless of double hit, double expressor, not GCB or non-GCB. And so for sure, we shouldn't be changing our consolidative dose based on these pathologic features, but it is something, um, it's really important for you to have 
good knowledge of all these things to really have a seat at the table and to be able to have respected input on how to manage these patients. So, um, yeah. Okay, next slide. All right, so Dr. Benovich was kind of hinting at all these recent trials um, that are now starting to shape the therapeutic landscape of how we manage these patients frontline. And she, it's kind of gotten pretty confusing. <laughs> so I'm sorry for the residents that are trying to get a hold of it, you know, get a handle on this, because I feel like, you know, even as attendings, we struggle at times. Most of these recent trials, the focus has truly been on using the PET to guide, uh, response to guide therapy with the ultimate goal really of emitting radiation. I mean, that's really what, what's at the heart of all of these studies. And if we assume that this patient's going to get a standard frontline chemotherapy regimen but, and she'll have a complete response on PET scan, we'll talk in a second about what that is, she would actually be a candidate for all of these things that you see listed according to the recent trial. So the updated SWOG trial, she would be a candidate for three cycles of RSHOP and radiation. For the LISA trial, um, which gave four or six cycles of RCHOP based on stage adjusted IPI, she would have had an IPF, stage adjusted IPF2, so she would have qualified for six cycles of RCHOP about radiation. And then with the other recent intergroup study, she would have been a candidate for RCHOP for four cycles without radiation. So quite confusing. Um, and there's a lot of discussion that usually goes on in the multidisciplinary setting of the best way to manage these. So before I tell you guys what we did, Dr. Yang and Dr. Benovich, how would you guys have managed this stage one, IPI one for her age, fuse large B cell lymphoma patient, non-GCB? Um, so I think the interesting component in her case is that it's an extranodal presentation. And I will say in extranodal presentations, I do favor using radiation as consolidation, um, even after a pet negative response. And the other thing, uh, so I would say, I would do RCHOP times three with radiation. Um, and I think that the, the medical oncologists in our group are fairly comfortable with that as well. Um, but for two reasons, one, because of the extranodal presentation, and then two, because um, she's older and RCHOP is not so, I don't know what, you know, it sounds like she had great performance status, but RCHOP is not um, always easy for these older patients to go through. And sometimes they look really good up front and then they do one cycle of chemotherapy and it kind of hits their KPS pretty hard for the, for the duration of therapy. Um, agree. I think this would have been probably a very lively discussion at our tumor board. I think the medical oncologist would have pushed very hard for RCHOP times four. Uh, I think I would have argued pretty strongly for three cycles in radiation. I think the extra cycle of RCHOP in an elderly person and the anthracycline consequences are under discussed in the medical oncology community. Um, and that 30 gray to that small site would really have minimal small toxicity long-term um, and really protect her cardiac issues. So that would have been yeah. my but I think it would have been a very lively conversation, and I think you have data to support either perspective. Yeah, completely agree with both of you. And we thought the same thing. Our um, medical oncologists are, are really embraced radiation and the use of radiation, especially. Oh, sorry, we got to go to the next. Uh, keep going. I'm talking too much. Next, next um, slide. <laughs> All right, next poll. So she gets three cycles of our top and has a pet. She has low level uptake, less than the mediastinum. What would you describe that as? We'll make this quick. I don't want to miss on Dr. Rabinovich's case. All right. Great. Most of you guys knew this. Next slide. We can kind of review this information quickly. And this is the five-point score, formerly the Deauville score. It's very important in all of lymphoma. Next slide. Um, so I don't think we have tons of time to get into this data. And so at least now you can see the, the study that is helping to guide this therapy. It's an older study initially randomizing patients in the pre-rituximab area to three cycles of top with radiation followed by versus eight cycles of CHOP. And this is where the, the three of our CHOP and radiation came from. Um, initial survival benefit published in the New England Journal of Medicine with longer follow-up, the curves came together. And presumably that was because of late relapses outside of the radiation field. But important to know that this 
stuck for patients with low-risk disease um, because you can see stage-adjusted IPI with 0-1 factor um, did quite well. And so despite these curves coming together, it's still a valid um, treatment approach for limited-stage patients. Next slide. And if you look at the long-term follow-up um, that was published um, a couple of years ago in JCO, um, they combined the patients treated on the pre rituximab randomized trial, and then they had a second uh, single-arm prospective study of our top time CO3 radiation. They combined all the patients together for this analysis. Um, and there wasn't any difference in overall survival or freedom from um, or PFS long-term. The one reason I quote this study, next slide, it's important thing for you guys to recognize, especially for tumor boards, is that the secondary malignancy 10-year um, cumulative incidence was not different. And so these are not hospice and former patients. And the secondary malignancy argument, which is really valid for medical oncologists who've seen horrific things that have happened to hospice and former patients, I would be traumatized too. Um, but it's really important for us to remind them and remind everyone that this is a different patient population. So as Dr. Rabinovich said, treating a to 30 gray to a very small um, nasal cavity field in a 72-year-old woman, you know, you're not expecting long-term um, very high secondary malignancy risks. And so important. And you can use this study to um, justify that assertion. Next slide. All right. Here's our plan. We did VMAT, 30.6 gray and eight. Uh, 0.8 gray fraction. And I really want to point out here that we have the five gray line turned on. And so we're really assessing even the low doses in this plan. Next slide. And the last point I wanted to mention, and you can play the video so they can scroll through the plan, is that it's really important to, um, to you do want to pay attention to toxicity and you want to try to mitigate the risk of that as much as you can. And with advanced technology, if you don't contour the normal structures, a computer is not going to avoid it for you. So please, we take a lot of time, especially in the Hodgkin's patients. I probably spend just as much time contouring my CTV as I do every single normal uh, structure. And auto contouring is not always is not typically the best way to do that. Um, so if, even if you use that, make sure normal structures are accurate. Um, and when you do a plan evaluation. This is different than solid tumors, where in solid tumors, you're really, really aiming to get that high dose line or your prescription dose line and all the other lines very conformal. We're, we care about conformality, but not as much for just the high dose. We're interested in conformality for the low dose, too. So if I don't put a dose somewhere, then I can't cause it long-term side effects there. So I really, really stress, not necessarily as much in this case, but for younger patients, too, paying attention to the five-grade line. That's it. Sorry, it took so another, long. Um, I was going to say another interesting point that um, Dr. Richard Sang, who's at Princess Margaret, once made that I really like is, you know, a lot of times um, in the community, folks will just take a head and neck constraint set and apply it to lymphomas being treated in the head and neck area. But, you know, you're giving less than half of the prescription dose that you would be in a head and neck case. And so, one of the things that he suggested that, that he does actually, which I really liked, um, is actually he, he basically um, does a ratio. So he kind of scales all of his um, normal tissue constraints to be um, respective of the fact that he's only giving 30 gray or 40 gray or whatever it might be. I don't know if um, um, Chelsea- Yeah, I love when he says that too. Question. I love that rule. All right. On to the left, next case. Okay, so in the theme of staying above the clavicles, this is gonna be our third case in the head and neck. Um, this has a few very clinically relevant little pieces that I think radiation oncologists can make a difference. So this was a 56 year old female who had a one year history of ocular pruritus. Um, her primary care doctor had treated her for allergic conjunctivitis with oral antihistamines and topical steroids, eye drops. Um, she eventually was referred to an ophthalmologist who noticed um, a fish flesh mass in the left inferior fornix of her left eye, uh, referred to an ophthalmologist, the ophthalmologist did a biopsy, and it was positive for a marginal zone lymphoma. Um, she had a workup, which we'll discuss in a minute, and she was referred to me for definitive radiation uh, to her left eye. And then of note, um, just again on, on the biopsy, I didn't show you what the cells look like, but it was positive for B cell markers, CD20, 79A, um, and was negative for CD5, CD10, CD23, and cyclin D1. And for the residents, I do think, I, I ask all my residents um, that they should have in mind when you're in tumor board and they put up 
a biopsy and they know that it's these small uniform B cells that you should think like a pathologist to know what the differential diagnosis is. And it's usually in this situation, um, other than the clinical scenario, that presentation, not, not the presentation, but on a slide, it would be CLL, SLL, mantle and marginal zone. And then the immunophenotypes and the flow will dis distinguish between them along with the clinical presentation. Next slide. So this is um, actually what happened. So this woman um, came to me, she had already had um, a workup, some of which I don't think she needed. But when I examined her, I saw this mass in her left inferior fornix, but she also had a mass in her right inferior fornix. And what I want you to notice is that this woman has um, nothing to appreciate if you just look at her. And very often, you know, you, with conjunctival uh, presentations of malt lymphoma, you won't see the disease unless you look. And you have to look by pulling down on the superior and inferior uh, palpebra to see them. And very often I've had residents go in and say, oh, well, there's no mass. And I, like you just lift the, the upper lid and this little thing pops out at you. So you have to look. So I actually said, you know, ma'am, I'm not um, an ophthalmologist, but I think you have bilateral disease. I sent her back for a biopsy on the other side. And sure enough, it was clinically obvious, but she had bilateral conjunctival malt lymphoma. So um, what's interesting about malt lymphoma is it has a predilection for bilaterality of orbital malt lymphomas. About 10% of patients have bilateral disease. So it's something you have to keep in mind. Um, and then just on history, the things that you want to keep extra attention to um, is does someone have a history of Sjogren's syndrome? Have they had cataract surgery? Because that'll be relevant in what you think about when you treat these patients. Um, we do um, PET CTs, but I would say at NCCN, there's a lot of controversy for these very indolent lymphomas, whether a PET is really the best test for these very indolent malt lymphomas. So CT scan, chest, abdomen, pelvis with IV contrast, um, many people say is also reasonable, but I would say PET is standard. Um, and given that she had normal labs, um, a normal exam other than this, um, I don't think a bone marrow biopsy was necessary, but she had one anyway. Um, okay, so I sent her for that right-sided right biopsy and sure enough, it was malt just like her left side. And so my question, next slide, um, is what stage would you give her? Would she be stage 1A, 2A, or 4A? You can put the E or not. That's kind of tricky. I like it. <laughs> it's kind of tricky. I was just thinking that. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, so technically, and actually Dr. Pinnock showed this previously, um, but in the Ann Arbor staging system involvement, so you, you're right that she has two sites, each orbit is a separate site, but they're each an extra lymphatic site. And in the Ann Arbor staging, if you have more than one extra lymphatic site, two orbits, it's actually technically a stage four. So um, she would be a stage 4A. Um, and this is a very unique, but not uncommon presentation with malt lymphoma. And if you look at the original Ann Arbor staging papers, and again, this is something Dr. Pinnock's mentioned, is we're used to saying extra nodal or you know, nodal treatment, but really the original definitions were extra lymphatic. And that makes much more sense when you realize that the thymus is part of the normal development of our um, you know, lymphatic system. Um, the appendix is Waldeyer's ring, your tonsils. That's all part of your lymphatic system. We don't think of it as nodal, it's not. Um, but it's part of how our um, lymphatic system develops. But anyway, so technically she actually is a stage 4A uh, conjunctival malt lymphoma. Next slide. So um, for this patient that has stage four disease, what would you recommend? Watch and wait um, because she's stage four, maybe incurable. Rituxan because she's indolent stage four, is she incurable? Palliative radiation, two gray times two or definitive radiation, 24 gray and 12 fractions to each eye. 
Okay. So before we move on, I think this is an interesting place. So um, most of you did agreed with what I would do, but I think this is an area of some legitimate um, diversion in practice patterns. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Penix because I have a pretty high feeling that she might treat this patient differently than I did. So um, Dr. Penix, how, how would you treat this patient? Yeah, we would do response adapted therapy with ultra low dose radiation. I would do four gray and two fractions, assess at three months, and she's responding. I would continue to observe and reserve additional 20 gray for stable or progressive disease. Um, and Dr. Yang, is that what you would do? Yeah, that's been my approach as well, although I, I fully admit it's controversial. <laughs> yeah, it's very controversial. We're hoping to have our, we finished accruing to our trial. And uh, we're just kind of letting the data mature, hoping to publish it, um, hopefully maybe next year. We need that. Um, next slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I treated her with 24 gray to each um, eye, and I'll show you how I did it. I want to spend a little time with the residents on the technique. The uh, data to support um, treating with 24 gray is based on a, a many data points, but this is a prospective, really the only prospective trial that's clean in this space. It's the FORT trial that was um, really designed, it stands for follicular RT, even though I like to think of it as um, four or 24 gray radiation. Um, and about 14% oh, of- I like that, I've never heard that before. <laughs> that's easier for me to remember, um, but it was meant to be four or uh, 24. Um, so that was the randomization in this trial, and 14% of patients um, were marginal zone lymphoma. And you can see that the time to progression is significantly and quite meaningfully improved with 24 grade versus 4 grade, which um, was true as well uh, for the marginal zone lymph lymphoma subset. They analyzed it sub se uh, separately. It was 100 versus 88%. Um, and so the uh, I would say the mature data or the classic way is to treat these patients with 24 gray. The issue that Dr. Pinnix and Dr. Yang and that all of us in the space are struggling with is that for sites that um, where normal tissues are very sensitive to even low doses like 24 gray, um, we would love to avoid treating patients to these higher doses. And what we don't know is, is there some dose between four and 24 that would work? Um, can we... Um, treat patients to four in this adaptive approach is Dr. Pinnix. We don't have a lot of data. I can tell you that in NCCN, we tried to make a change in the wording to, to consider four gray in two fractions um, for these sensitive sites, and it did not have much traction. Um, but that, I think, is um, really the two choices, 24 gray or four gray. Um, and to be very careful, the nice thing about conjunctival lymphomas is you can see the disease. Next slide. Um, so this is a, a, a simple, but um, I think fairly elegant technique that isn't, um, that sometimes gets lost. So I just wanna go over it as an option. Although in um, ILRA guidelines, we talk about treating um, the entire organ for marginal zone uh, lymphomas, this I would say would be an area where most people would say it's reasonable to treat the partial organ. So I did not choose to treat the entire orbit. I treated uh, just um, the anterior portion of the eye, which Dr. Um, Yang reviewed quite nicely. Um, and just a few points to remember um, the anatomy is that the conjunctiva covers the inner edge of the lid, the palpebra, folds over into the fornice superiorly and inferiorly, and then extends over um, the globe itself. We call that the bulbar conjunctiva, and it ends just where the iris. If you can start to see the iris, that's about where the conjunctiva ends. And then behind it is the lens, which in an adult has a diameter of about a centimeter in most people. So we use um, anterior electrons with six MeV electrons. We use a hanging lens block um, the patient during CT simulation has their head pointed up at the ceiling because you're not going to be able to do um, any collimator with the gantry because you're going to use gravity um, for that hanging lens block. So um, 
you can see that our hanging legs block is about seven millimeters across. There's a classic Princess Margaret paper that shows another hanging lens block that's about a little over a centimeter. Um, I do do a CT scan with a mask and I use the globe as a surrogate for the extent of um, where the conjunctiva is. And I prescribe to a depth of a centimeter with bolus. And when the patient is set up, if you can look at the first column of pictures at the bottom, uh, the patient is looking straight up and you position the hanging lens block so that the shadow follows over her lens. And she has to keep her eyes open because if she closes her eye, there'll be a little bit of the conjunctiva under the lid that would fall under the shadow of the block. I'm not sure if that makes sense. So it's a lip. Does that make sense, Dr. Yang or Dr. Penix? Okay, and then what we do is we have the bolus with a hole in the center so she can continue to stare at the hanging um, eye block when the radiation is being delivered and try not to blink. So it's um, fairly simple old school, but a technique that a lot of people haven't seen. Um, any of you are welcome to reach out to me and I will connect you to our um, dosimetrists who um, we have a guy in our department, Wayne, who's the guru on this. Um, and so that's how we treated her. Um, and what was fascinating is when I was treating her at 14 gray, she had complete resolution of her pruritus and her inferior fornicial uh, masses were already uh, visibly regressing. Um, Dr. Penix and Dr. Yang, can you tell me technically how you would treat a patients at your department? Would you have used um, 3D, IMRT, um, a different technique for conjunctival presentations? We can't hear you. And we are over time as well. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Say it again. Dr. Penix, um, I don't think I could hear oh, you. Dr. Oh, sorry. I was saying that. Sorry, I was saying that we're, we're over time because you had other slides. I didn't want to take away from the other things that you had to say. Okay. Um, and Dr. Yang, what technique do you use for conjunctival presentations? I also use electrons um, with a custom bolus. Um, I put in, you know, I will say I've seen a wide variety. So at MSK, we actually used to do all of these as clinical setups. Um, and um, now, actually, most recently, I treated a patient. Um, the physicists have actually created uh, these, I, they've 3D printed um, mock ups of. Um, basically lens shield that we can actually put in at SIM, which is actually really nice. And then we swap it out for the real lens shield um, at the time of treatment. That's great. Okay, last slide I think is the next one. Um, so uh, clinically during treatment, I give all these patients um, dexamethasone eye drops just to help with the anticipated conjunctivitis. You have to remember that although radiation can cause um, cataracts, so can chronic steroids. So you have to remind patients that they should discontinue use within a week or two after radiation's over. Um, and um, she's several years out. She's, it's actually more than three years now. And she just has an occasional dry eye. She doesn't need any prescription drops. She's NED and she's doing very well. Thank you, sorry for the rush at the end. Um, I thought that those were all wonderful um, cases and we all really learned a lot about lymphoma of the head and neck too. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists. Um, thank you to Nav. Um, be sure to make sure to um, do the post survey. Next slide. Um, you can um, register for the next Rover session on radonvirtual.com. Next slide. And our next panel will be on May 7th. It will be breast cancer. Um, and we will have um, three um, different attendings, Dr. Jimenez, Dr. Evans, and Dr. Corbin. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.